Well, anyways, welcome to South Beach Church. My name's Luke Frechette. I'm one of the pastors here. I get the opportunity to lead you guys in God's word today. So as I mentioned, find a copy of the scriptures, open up to Mark chapter eight. And I got a series of announcements on the screens to my left and to my right as well. That way we can know what's going on throughout the rest of the week. We don't just gather here on Sundays. So as a matter of fact, as I was putting together the announcements, thinking through various life groups and four is more Bible studies. One of our staff members just started again his series through the four is more time together. They meet at Starbucks on a particular day and so many ways to plug in. Throughout the ministry, I've been in the ministry now for 24 years, and I've heard probably one complaint the most, which is, I don't know where I fit, or I don't know how to plug in or connect. And that's going to be a perennial problem where we find ourselves, man, what do I do? Even every day, like, what do I do today? So I would encourage you guys, pay attention to the announcements, try something new. As a matter of fact, this week, brand new Bible study starting for the ladies, opportunities to plug in with the guys as well. So hey, here's the deal. Pay attention. The announcements go this way. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, Monday, there's the young adult group at the offices. Check that out. There's Bible studies at the FTK building on Monday nights for the dudes as well. Tuesdays, there's a Bible study for the ladies at the offices at 6 p.m. That's the book of Revelation. This is week two, so you haven't missed too much. So gals, check that out this Tuesday night. 6 p.m. at the offices. Also on Wednesday morning here at the fellowship, beginning a brand new series, the early church, the women's Bible study re-begins. So they're gonna uh, convene again this Wednesday, 9.45, they're there for fellowship. You can check your kids in, pound a couple cups of coffee. 10 a.m., they begin the teaching series. And then there's some small group time, prayer time as well. That's every Wednesday here at 10 a.m. So gals, this is the first start. If your schedule allows for that, make a beeline over here. Get that done, it's gonna be radical. Then Wednesday, there's middle school and high school. Last week was our launch week. We started out after a summer break. So middle schooler and high schooler, pray for the next generation. Pray for the next generation leaders, Sunday school, middle school, high school, college, young adults, everybody that's on the up and coming chance to raise, uh, be raised up to be a leader for this next generation. So that's Wednesdays. And then also don't forget that there's a Thursday prayer at the offices, Thursday prayer. You guys can join us for an hour of power as we pray from 7.30 to 8.30. Everyone's invited. Ruby's in the Rough meets that day also at the uh, FTK building for the ladies, 5.30 Bible study on Thursday. Is it Wednesday or Thursday? Wednesday? Wednesday, I'm all messed up. This is first service, my first try at this today, so we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's Friday, Series 33 for the dudes, as well as a current events Bible study going on Fridays at 6 p.m. at the FTK building. So, so many things going on. Also, check it out, October 12th. What's the date today? The 15th, 16th, something like that? So just a month away, we have our tournament, uh, golf tournament at the Salishan Golf Course. And so we're looking for sponsors, looking for people to golf, looking for people to sponsor and pretend that they know how to golf and to show up. That's me. And so I'm going to be there making fun of myself. I've got two sets of golf clubs. I don't, I don't need any golf clubs at this point in my life. But So if you need to borrow, borrow a pair, you can borrow mine. Hey, there are these posters. We printed these up. If you're a business owner or if you like live in Lincoln City or Walport or elsewhere, go golfing, grab one of these and put it up somewhere. We've got a month to promote this. There's a QR code on there. You can go ahead and scan that and get more information about it and or just donate some uh, money so we can. It's a fundraiser for South Beach Christian School. So excited. Year three, South Beach Christian School right now. Year one, 85 students, year two, 105 students, year three, 120 students, all in the same look. Yeah, praise God, that's crazy. And it's been such a trip because if we were allowed to, what I mean by that, space limitations is what's keeping us at these numbers. If we were allowed to grow bigger, we'd have 150, probably 170 students, maybe even 200 by now. But I think God says, no, no, you guys need to grow. Get your systems down. Get your roots down before the fruits come out. So we're just trusting the Lord every year is a little bit bigger, a little bit better. So keep praying for this school. It's been a real miracle to watch that happen, partnering with Newport Christian Church. So thankful for their leadership team and their hospitality. So that's happening. Uh, if you if questions, get a hold of us and we'll let you know about that. Also, man, just a quick announcement about the uh, building. Actually, I got one more announcement before we move into the building and then getting into the text today. The Women's Night Out event is also on the schedule for the end of this uh, month. I think it's the 27th or 29th. What is it, 27th? The 27th, which is a Friday, 6 p.m. begins. You can show up as early as 5.45. Earlier, if you want, 5.45, the doors are gonna open. Fellowship, grab your chair, opportunity. We want people to get underway in eating. Dinner's provided right away so we can have that time of fellowship and food before we move into worship and a time of uh, devotion in God's word. 
It's gonna be powerful, so uh, gals, don't miss it. I think last time we did this, uh, there was about 130, 140, maybe even 150 people that showed up. It was packed. It was so fun, so exciting. So uh, dudes, by the way, plan on being there at the end, not the beginning or during, but at the end to put all the tables away and help clean up. We're gonna show up like angels with uh, facial hair. It's gonna be awesome, so... I'll be there, the 27th, put it on your calendar. Hey, moving through the announcements uh, into our building project. As you guys know, this is week 32 at the Foursquare location. We've been here for 32 weeks now. Our first Sunday here was the 28th of January. And ever since then, we've just been enjoying God's uh, uh, provision for us and the hospitality of Newport Foursquare. So thank you guys for enduring our three services and those of you who are online watching at home as well. And we're moving at the fastest pace we possibly can to build new building in South Beach. We had a huge week this last week. It was actually, uh, the the weeks just kind of pile up and they move into months and then into years. And so this week though, we had to kind of pinch ourselves a little bit and say, is this really happening? We were putting concrete in the ground, which one of the contractors said, hey, this is the point of no return. And I said, no, we already passed that point a long time ago. But what he means is the concrete went into the ground and there's about 24, I actually don't know the exact number, maybe 30 footings that we had to pour. The footings were so big. One footing alone took an entire concrete truck, a cement truck, you see those trucks? The footing, these are over-engineered, it's crazy. We can have 500 mile an hour winds come on the Oregon coast and everything's gonna be gone except our church. It'll be right there. It ain't going nowhere. It ain't going nowhere. Right on, right on. So I made a two minute video of our pouring of the footings. Let's go ahead and watch this and celebrate. This is what happened this last week. Awesome. So much effort, so much work going into pouring those footings. And if you guys know the calendar, I've been writing stuff down for the last 10 years, kind of making sure I identify when certain things happen. And it was a year ago next week, a year ago, September 18th, a year ago next week that we actually mobilized Table Mountain Forestry. We began our heavy machinery out there. And a year later, which happens to be this next coming Wednesday and Thursday, we're going to be pouring the actual foundation. The pad's going to be going in. I just think the Lord is so awesome in his timing and the way that he takes the exact right time for our lives to build our foundation, to do what only he knows. And that foundation's concrete. It's huge. And I think about it, I'm like, is this over-engineered? Like, yes, it's way over-engineered. And, and sometimes we wonder in our own lives, Lord, what are you doing right now? And he's like, I'm doing foundation work. 
I'm doing a deeper work in you. Well, Lord, I just wanna see the walls go up and I wanna see things happen. I says, I know, but I gotta kinda dig out some of those things and I gotta test the soil of your heart and I gotta bring in this extra rebar of the Holy Spirit and do all these things. And so be that as it may, thank you guys for your prayer. This Thursday is gonna be huge. I believe, my numbers might be a little wrong, but I believe that was about 100 yards of concrete that was poured into the ground and there's gonna be upwards of three to 400 yards being poured into the ground um, on Thursday. Thursday's our big foundation day. So 20, 30, 40 concrete trucks to bring a concrete in from Lincoln City and from Newport and from all over the valley, concrete trucks. If you see a concrete truck on Thursday, just take a picture of it. That's going into the ground at South Beach Church. It's rad. It's awesome. Keep praying. You're welcome to come up there. It's going to be a rodeo, so make sure and just kind of uh, drive carefully or park to the right when you get there. Throw a hard hat on, stay out of the way, unless you want concrete all over you. It's going to be radical. Here's the deal, though. I've been asking you guys to keep praying. I'm going to keep doing that. Keep praying, trusting, and giving faithfully as unto the Lord to continue to give of your tithe and offering generously and cheerfully. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. And I truly believe that if everybody in the body of Christ, not just our church, but every church, just gave what God's asked us to give, there would be no problems, no shortfalls for all, no shortfalls for all the ministry needs and for all the projects that God's put in front of us. So keep praying about that. Here's the deal though. Today we have brand new, off the press, these September pledge cards. We did this last September as well. This is an opportunity for you and your family to grab one of these cards, go home, read through it, and pray about it. And ask God, what do you want us to do as a family? Number one, do you want us to pray for the church? Everyone say, duh, that's amen. Yes, amen. Lord, do you want us to give of our tithe and offering? That's the first steps. And then secondly, thirdly, into this questionnaire, ask yourself, Lord, how much can my family give this month above and beyond our tithe and offering? And when you mark that, mark that little thing there, you can give us one of them, keep the other one for yourself to put on your fridge and pray and hold yourself accountable. And you can give upwards of $100. If we get 100 donors, to give 100 bucks in September, just 100 people, 100 bucks. And then if we get 75 donors to give 200 bucks, and then if we get 50 donors, 50 families to give 500 bucks, and if we get 15 donors to give a $1,000 check, and 10 donors to give 2,000, five donors to give 3,000, it'll be $100,000 in September above and beyond. And the way that the Lord put this on my heart last year is to give everybody an opportunity to give. Some people can't write a check for 500 bucks. That's way too much money. They don't have that kind of money, and I understand that. Some people have been gifted by God to write those types of checks, and now would be the opportunity to say, let's do this, honey. Let's pray, and it's unto the Lord. Let's worship him. Other people might say, 100 bucks? Where am I gonna get 100 bucks? I've got so many pairs of shoes right now. I could sell some shoes at the pawn shop. I could sell that extra pair of golf clubs I have. There's lots of creative ways you can say, you know what I wanna do? I wanna be a part of this project and I want to do my part as well. So hey, grab one of these. I'm not sure where Toby put these, probably on the outside. I'll try and remind you as you leave to grab one of those. In the back also, there's a little financial graph that kind of details the schedule of needs for the finances coming in. And we're praying that the Lord would give us wisdom, the wisdom of Solomon, to know exactly what he wants us to do. But that he would also partner with the building project by using the people of God, not just the leadership, but the people of God to do exactly what God wants us to do. Here's the deal. We're gonna try and raise $100,000 in September. And we had a family already approach us and say, hey, I see what you're trying to do. I would like to match campaign in September, everything that comes in up to $25,000. So another generous, praise the Lord. Thank you, Stephen. It wasn't Stephen, by the way, but thank you for clapping, yeah. $25,000, it could have been Stephen. Well, it might have been Stephen. It was Stephen. $25,000, and I just say, I'm so grateful for the generosity of our church. Man, when we have a need, historically, throughout the 14 years I've been here, if we have a need, if we're going on a mission trip to Haiti or doing something somewhere, the congregation here steps up and makes sure everything gets cared for. It's incredible. We've never passed a hat, never taken an offering in this way. We talk about finances when it's important to us and when we need to move in that direction. And one of the things that the Lord's putting on my heart during the season, you're gonna hear me talk about money more than normal. And I believe as I mature in the Lord, the Lord wants me to make sure that we all mature in the Lord in what we're gonna call financial stewardship because there's gonna be a day where you and I, we're gonna see it today in the text, when you and I get to heaven, the Lord's gonna say, what did you do with the days I gave you? What did you do with the dollars I gave you? What did you do with the deeds that I gave you to do? How was that? And it's stewardship over the lives that we've been given. And I, for one, need more wisdom and help in the stewardship of my life. I wanna make sure my days are, are invested well. I wanna make sure that the deeds God's given to me, the talents and the time and the treasure that God's asked Luke Frechette to steward are stewarded well. You don't need to raise your 
your hand, but how many of you guys could just nod your head and say you could grow in this area of stewardship over your days, dollars, and deeds? Like I could grow, I could grow in that. And I wanna be held accountable in that way. I wanna be able to honor God better in my finances. Let me ask another question. How many of you guys think that you're gonna need God's help? in your future financial needs. Anybody think you're gonna need God's help? Okay, isn't that crazy? Every one of you should've put your hands around, I'm gonna need God's help in my future financial needs. And I believe that what we do in the days, the little things will bless us as we get to the bigger things. So uh, let's just pray all that in and ask the Lord to bless that $25,000 match campaign. So again, if you give a thousand bucks today or 50 bucks today, it will be doubled up to the limit of 25,000 for the month of September. So we could make that $100,000 goal easily if we all ask the Lord what he wants us to give. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. And we ask, God, that you would lead us and guide us, especially, Lord, in this idea of stewardship. Lord, not just finances, but you said that where our treasure is, there our heart would be also, whatever we're just holding on to. Maybe it's your free time. Like, oh, man, I just love my days off. Don't, don't touch my days off. Or, or maybe this quiet time. And that's where your heart is. And the Lord said, hey, what are you doing with that time? And are you investing it in others? Are you investing it in my kingdom? Maybe it's stuff, monetary things, and Lord, I don't, I don't know what it is for everybody. I know what it is for me, and I want you to have, Lord, access to my heart, access to my accounts, access to my time. And I pray against selfishness, Lord, and me-isms and all these other things that get in the way. And Lord, we believe you're doing something here at South Beach Church. It's incredible. It's an honor. It's humbling. The way you provided for us, Lord, every step of the way, even to this moment in time, Lord, using this platform here at the Foursquare Church, it's incredible. Lord, that all the guys are getting ready for one of the biggest pours of their life. Lord, some of these guys have never poured a foundation this big. And Lord, you're doing that for your glory and for others' good in South Beach. And so we thank you, Jesus. Would you provide everything? And would you use us, Lord? Make us those men and women that maybe even at this season of our lives, we get it. We realize to go all in for Jesus is the right thing to do. To not hold back anything, time, talent, and treasure. When I just repent of all the things I'm just greedy over, of my own stuff, like, ah, I don't want to give that. I don't want, Lord, can you just, man, don't bring that up. I just repent. And ask, Lord, you'd search our hearts. So we thank you, Jesus, for this banner week. Thank you for all you've done. Keep us humble. And may even today, Lord, we find ourselves more in love with you, less, Lord, in love with the things of this world. We need you. We love you. We ask you to bless your word as it finds, Lord, place in our heart. Produce fruit again, we ask. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Hey, take your Bibles and go with me to Mark chapter 8. And we're going to begin reading where we left off last week in verse 17. Jesus now has been going through the area of Galilee and the area of the Decapolis and the area where the Romans and the Gentiles and the Jews kind of co-mingled. And Jesus is on mission. He's around two and a half years into his ministry right now. He knows he's approaching soon his death, burial, and resurrection, the climax of his ministry. And this is important because the disciples didn't know any of this was going on. And yet everything Jesus taught them, everything Jesus said was so important for them at this season of their lives. And so he healed this man who was deaf and who was mute and couldn't hear and couldn't speak. And then he fed 4,000 people and he got into the boat and they began to worry about the bread. Remember that? And he said, whoa, no, nobody packed a lunch. Meanwhile, Jesus was warning them. Be careful, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Herodians. Both of these leavens, these ideologies, these philosophies would have been religious in nature. Remember they were mad at Jesus all the time for loving people and for serving people, for being generous and kind and heavenly minded. He said, careful about being religious, man. Don't get into your traditions, don't get into religions. Careful of that stuff, be careful. That leaven will mess you up. But not just the leaven of religion, but the leaven of the Herodians. The Herodians were political in nature and they were worldly in nature. It was all about fixing things this way, horizontal kingdoms. And Jesus said, man, careful. Isn't that crazy when Jesus came? They expected him to deliver themselves from the Roman occupation, which would have made so much sense. The Romans were the worst, boo, you know? And Jesus shows up, the Messiah. He didn't really care. Not about that. He looked beyond all that their current political system, their current political needs, their current political oppression and economic destruction that was coming. And instead of fixing it, he actually said, oh yeah, it's actually gonna get worse. And I'm not gonna fix it. This is crazy. Why? Because it's not an earthly kingdom that Jesus was constructing, but it was a heavenly kingdom. So he said, be careful of that leaven. It will permeate you. It will take over. Meanwhile, Jesus looks at them 
And they're talking to each other while he's talking. He's like, what are you guys talking about? Like, someone forgot to pack lunch. <laughs> so, what did you say? They just got done feeding 4,000 people. And they begin, and here's what Jesus says. And I say all that to say this. I don't know about you, don't raise your hands, but how many of you guys are slow learners? <sighs> Those of you who just raised your hands, I said, don't raise your hands. So thank you for sh- proving, you know. I was like, dude, I raised my hand too. <laughs> ah, it's the worst. I don't think there's anybody but a slow learner. It's just the way it is. You ever compare the human species to the animal kingdom? Most of the animal kingdom, when a baby is born, there's like a very short period of infancy, very short period where they're chicks, you know, become, before they become chickens, like just a couple weeks goes by. Some of these animals come out and they can already like run from tigers, like they're in the woods. Like when humans are born, man, they're worthless for like the first 30 years, you know. <laughs> you can't trust them. They don't do nothing good. You gotta watch them. Humans, God made us humans on purpose. Oh yeah, it takes you guys a while to figure things out. Jesus is in the boat with these homies. They got one loaf of bread. Look at what he says to them. Verse 17, but Jesus being aware of it, that is their distractions, why do you reason because you have no bread? And then he asks a series of hurtful questions. Do you not perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, don't you see? And having ears, don't you hear? Don't you remember? Now, I don't know what his tone was. I don't think he was being harsh or mean, but the questions are piercing and cutting. And then he asked some questions that were right in their immediate memory bank. Hey, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? It wasn't a proverbial question. They give an answer. They said to him, 12. Also, he said, when I broke the seven for the 4,000, how many large baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And so he said to them, how is it that you do not understand? Now, Jesus knows humanity. He knows that we're frail. He knows that we're made of dust. He knows that we're just learning. I don't think Jesus was surprised, but I think he was trying to soften their hearts to the complexity and the perplexion that they were gonna continue to face as they matured. And he asked them this question, how come you don't understand yet? <laughs> I don't know. Don't you? Isn't that just like a uh, frustrating question? Everyone learns at different speeds. We have all different types of learnings. And some people are audio, and some people are visual, some people are tactile. We're, we learn differently. And Jesus says, did you guys, did you hear when I, did you see? Did you feel, do you remember? How do you not understand? And he asked him a question previously. He said, why are your hearts still hard? And let's just explore this. There was a lack of understanding and there was a presence of a hardened heart. Which one comes first? Does a hardened heart lead us to lack of understanding or does a lack of understanding lead us to a hardened heart? Or it depends on what, thank you, yes. Or does it depend on what day it is? Either way, the heart of the issue is an issue of the heart. In our lives, in your life right now, I promise you there's a myriad of things you just don't understand. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I really don't understand. I don't get it, I don't, under, I don't have the full picture. And there's a temptation then at that point to harden your heart. You could call it differently, protect my heart. I'm just gonna protect myself. I'm gonna insulate a little bit. I'm gonna pull back from my spouse. I'm gonna pull back from my kids. I'm gonna pull back from my life group. I really, I don't understand. So I'm going to, and you do this as a, as a reaction to protect yourself, but really it's just a hardening of your heart. Now, I just don't trust what's going on because I don't understand my heart is hard and or, or, or through other reasons and other means in life, your heart can get hardened so many ways taking too much attention to the things of this world, not letting the water of God's word soften you and his spirit search you, becoming more worldly or Herodian in nature, more politically bent and distracted and your heart becomes hardened in that way. And when your heart becomes hardened in that way, guess what? You don't have understanding of what's going on. Meanwhile, this is crazy, this is crazy, listen. Meanwhile, the Lord's doing things and you have no idea what he's doing. Don't raise your hand during this one, but do you ever have a season of your life where you just have no idea what God's doing? I don't know what's going on. Let me ask you another question. Does God know exactly what he's doing in that season? (laughs) We tend to think, well, he must be lost too, you know? I can't figure it out. He must be all messed up, you know? We would never say that. But in our minds, we can't figure it because our hearts are hard. And when our hearts get hard, we don't understand. And then we could, man, it's the devil's playground. Hardened heart, lack of understanding. Which one, I don't know what you're dealing with today but the heart of every issue is an issue of the heart. And here's Jesus, loves the boys, loves them so much. He says, guys, do you remember the 12? Remember the seven? 
Do you remember? He's warning them. He's teaching them. He's instructing them. Look back. Look back. And he asks them, why don't you understand? Last verse again, verse 21. How is it that you do not understand? I'm so glad he asked this question with tenderness in his heart. He should have at this point just thrown them all overboard, shouldn't he? He's like, I'm done with you guys. You know the Lord's character. Man, worship was so good today, so powerful. So, so, so needed for me to cleanse the palate of my soul, just screaming out to the Lord the truth of those songs. Because there's so much things in my life I don't understand right now. And it could be because my heart's hard. But there's so many areas in my life right now where my heart is hard. There's just a heart, there's a protectedness. I don't wanna, I'm not gonna do that anymore, you know? Because I don't understand. And Jesus looks at us right now and says, I, I get it, let's go. I've been faithful before. And the next story we're going to see, the next two stories, if we have time today, hopefully we'll see, I don't know how much time we have, we'll see what happens. The next two stories, Jesus continues to exemplify himself as the shepherd of our souls. He should discipline them right now. He should leave them. He should kind of renegotiate the contract and get a new crew of fish and buddies. But instead, he continues to be the great shepherd of our souls, the great shepherd and the great servant and the great savior. Let's get into some new territory in context here. The disciples are probably feeling a little sheepish and a little dumb right now. <laughs> Why are we so hard-hearted? Why do we forget so much? I would raise my hand and be like, I wanna be a part of that team. I've got the same questions. Look at verse 22. It says, then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and they begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and he said, I see men like trees walking. The jolly green giant, obviously, in the background there. Verse 25, and then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And when he was restored and saw everyone clearly, and then he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Stop right there, eyes up here, wow. Jesus now, with the boys, these hard-hearted, lack of understanding boys, goes to Bethsaida. Now, there were two or three Bethsaidas in this area. It was a very common name, but we're gonna assume it was on the east side there, right above the Jordan River, Bethsaida, where he had been previously. And he goes back to this city previously where he'd been kicked out of, previously where he'd been rejected, previously where he'd done great miracles, but now he goes back because he's the great shepherd that ever pursues the wayward sheep. Is that encouraging to anybody but me that he keeps coming after us when we find ourselves responding wrongly to his goodness? And he goes back, and when they see him, they bring this blind man to him. Now we're gonna talk about the resilience of the Lord if there, if there needs to be such a word. We like to be resilient. Like, yeah, man, I, respond, I re rebounded. I kept going. I, I didn't stop. The Lord, though, man, he is the one who never stops, never sleeps, never slumbers over his sheep. He's always working. Even when we can't feel it, he's working. We can't see it, he's working. When we don't believe that he's working, he's working. I hope you know this, especially if you're a leader of any capacity whatsoever. You're a man or a woman or a mom or a dad or a husband or a wife or a brother or a sister or a son or a daughter. Did I, did I get you? You're any one of those people. You're a leader, you're influencing some people and you have to believe God is always moving. And he exemplifies this by going to Bethsaida. Let me read to you what Jesus actually said in Matthew 11 about Bethsaida. This is earlier. It says, then he began in Matthew 11, verse 20, it says, then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. And he goes through a list. Bethsaida's one of them. He says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, that's Bethsaida, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And he goes on and on in Matthew 11. So Jesus had feelings about this town and their impotence towards his miracles but Jesus always returns. I'm just so thankful that you know the mercy of the Lord's for you today. His grace is for you. No matter where you've strayed, no matter where you've erred, no matter what you've done, the mercies of the Lord are new. How often? Every morning. I follow a uh, weather app that gives me 17 different locations around the world, so I know where the sun's rising every single minute of the day. His mercies are new every day for Luke Frechette. I hope they're the same for you. 
And he goes to this place, Bethsaida, and let's just kind of study the story as it unfolds. Verse 22, again, you know the context now. Then he came to Bethsaida. And they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. These guys evidently had faith. Jesus shows up. They go get their blind buddy and bring him to Jesus, which encourages me so much. This blind guy couldn't have done this for himself. He needed friends that loved him and knew Jesus. Now, let me just pause right there. How many of you guys can recall the people in your life that loved Jesus and brought you to him? Just think about it. How many people prayed for you, encouraged you to come to church, said, hey, I see your blindness, Luke. I was gonna say Pastor Luke, but I wasn't Pastor Luke then. I I see where you're erring, where you're going. And they brought me to Jesus. Whether they were bringing my name to his throne without my knowledge, many people, my mom and dad primarily, praying for me my whole life. Lord, protect Luke, rescue Luke. Lord, use Luke. Now here's the deal. People did the same for you. You're here today because you were blind at one point, separated from God, distant and alienated from his promises. And somebody brought you to Jesus and he began to minister to you. How many people in your life right now do you love, but they're still blind? Matter of fact, I'm just gonna pause. I want the Holy Spirit to put three or four, maybe more people in your mind right now that don't know Jesus. That you love. That God's put it in them. Maybe family members might be neighbors, might be community members. God would say, don't stop bringing them to me. This wouldn't have been easy. This would have been an effort. This would have been a challenge. Do this. Maybe you have a prayer list in your Bible or your journal where you're writing names down and praying for people. These guys, I bet Jesus was honored by their love and devotion and sacrifice and service to this blind guy because they begged him to heal this guy. Let's just call that prayer. Jesus, you gotta heal this. They begged him. I'm not sure what this looked like. Maybe Jesus is surrounded by people. They had to push in. Prayer. Somebody came up with an acronym for pray or push. Push, push, push. P-U-S-H. Pray until something happens. Man, you just gotta push your way into the kingdom. You gotta push your way into his presence. Pray until something happens in the lives of the men and women around you. It could be your own blindness. Well, these guys exemplify that for us and they begged him to touch him. So I love what Jesus does. If you're a note taker, you can kind of write some of these principles down here. Look at verse 23. It says, so he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. Stop right there, eyes up here. When Jesus begins this work, he always does it a little differently with each and every person. He grabs this blind guy and he could have healed him right then and there. How many guys are okay with that? Right then and there, Jesus snapped his fingers. Jesus kind of gave him the wand, the the Jedi wand. You know, there's so many ways. Actually, I'll back up and say this way. In the Bible, there's seven, eight, depending on how you interpret it. Seven, we'll call it because it's a cool number. Seven different blind people recorded that Jesus heals. And he heals them all differently. Now, if I were gonna do this, I'd be a little more, you know, a little more concise. Well, blind people sit over here and deaf people over here, you know, and the lepers over here. We got, we got the whole system because that's what religion does. And Jesus says, no, I, I don't religiousize my people. Each person needs a unique approach. Each person has a unique personal relationship with me. Jesus, knowing this guy, by the way, I wanna piece it together with the first verse and the last verse of this section. Jesus grabs him and says, hey, let's get out of town. Why would he do this? I don't know why he did this. I know this though, once he let him out of town and healed him, he said, don't go back into that town. Maybe there was something in that town that he needed to be led away from and never go back to. That makes a lot of sense in the way that Jesus delivered me from my blindness, my spiritual distance from the Lord. When people begged that Jesus would touch me, Jesus began to intervene on my behalf and he grabbed my hand and said, Luke, we gotta leave some of these relationships, bro. We gotta leave some of these areas, some of these thought processes and ideologies and philosophies of man. And you guys know your own testimony. I know mine as well. But usually in order to follow Jesus, you've gotta leave something else behind. Someone say amen. You can't, there's a misnomer that says, I just wanna be saved, sanctified and set apart, but I don't wanna change. (laughs) It's hilarious, it's hilarious. Well, I don't want to give up too much stuff and I don't want to go and become a different person. Man, I'm so thankful I was able to go with the Lord, become a different person. And by the way, it wasn't easy. I don't know your story. I only know my story. It was difficult. I had to leave a lot of relationships, a lot of practices, a lot of things in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus grabs this blind guy. He can't see. What if Jesus, wouldn't it have made sense if Jesus healed him first, gave him his sight back, and then said, now follow me out of this town. We gotta get out of here. 
Faith is interesting though because it builds upon steps of obedience. We call it progressive revelation here at South Beach Church sometimes where God progressively reveals to us the steps of our life. He doesn't tell us everything at once. He'll put a desire in your heart. He'll give you an obedience step one at a time. And when you take that step of obedience, oftentimes he reveals to you the next progressive step. My pastor, Mark Anderson, put it this way. Light obeyed brings more light. And I feel like I should just do this thing. Well, you should probably do that thing then. And you do that thing and all of a sudden the next light comes on. Oh my gosh, it's over here now. And as I'm gonna follow the Lord, the first step for this blind guy, please heal our friend. Jesus looks at everyone, grabs and says, let's get out of here. And he leads him away from the town. This guy could have resisted, could have rejected. I I don't, I, I, but he, he went with him. And I would just encourage you guys, those who are watching online at home, those who are here right now, God wants to take us even in our current state of vision, our current state of sight, as we see here, I already read the text. This particular healing is progressive. Jesus prays for him, spits in his eye, touches him. He looks up, he doesn't see perfectly. Jesus repeats the process, and then he sees perfectly. This is the only miracle that I can discern that, this, that Jesus used this approach to model that it's okay for there to be progressive healing for there to be steps of faith obeyed and moved in. One might guess, critics kind of wonder, was this because Jesus didn't have his protein bar in the morning? Is that what's going on? Was it the lack of bread? Did Jesus try real hard to heal this guy and he couldn't do it? So he just, no, that's not the case whatsoever. See, this is God, this is Jesus in the flesh. This is the one who spoke the world into existence and suns and stars and moons and universes appeared through his very thought. This is the one who multiplied previously bread and fish and turned water into wine. When he didn't heal this guy immediately in this way, it's because he chose to. You're gonna have to settle into that one because I want it to be healed right away. The Lord says, well, I'm doing stuff. I'm modeling things right now for my disciples who are watching, for this man who's growing. And there's questions that come up in my mind, maybe questions that come up in your mind as well, like what the heck's going on here? Maybe it was that Jesus was bolstering this guy's faith. He had a little bit of faith, he's right there, and Jesus says, okay, I'm gonna pray for you, put spit in your eyes. That takes a little bit of faith to have spit in your eyes, doesn't it? <laughs> we talked about this before, they believed in the first century and they were right, that spit had medicinal qualities, that it actually had enzymes and proteins and antibacterial quality, it has all that. We don't know why Jesus put spit in his eyes. He didn't do this with every blind person. One commentator suggested that like a, you've all seen blind people with their eyes open before. We've seen this before. This guy's eyes might have been kind of sealed shut and maybe crusted over in some way and maybe the spittle was necessary to begin this opening process. I'm not sure why Jesus did this. But when Jesus prayed for him and said, what do you see? He said, I see men like trees walking. Now, I don't think that the men were like trees. I think this man had had sight before. And so when his eyes were open, he's like, I don't... I don't know if that's a tree or a man. I see a man, but it's, it's blurry. It's, it's not quite clear. And sometimes the Lord in our lives also in this process of healing and restoration and redemption, we don't see everything perfectly right away. Matter of fact, <laughs> I don't think there's anybody like, I get it, I got it. You know, you all, we all see each other a little messed up. We don't see perfectly. And I believe Jesus was showing this to show us that steps obeyed bring more clarity and faith is a muscle that we work. It's not a pill we take and we have to continue to DTNRT, do the next right thing and don't give up. Maybe faith was being bolstered, maybe persistence. Maybe Jesus was teaching the disciples, hey, sometimes you gotta persist in prayer. Don't give up. How many of you guys have got a lot of quit in you? You got some quit in you? You try it, try, try it once, I didn't work. I was like, I guess that didn't work. And yet the Lord's leading you in something, just keep going. Maybe it's persistence. Maybe the third reason, maybe it was faith he was bolstering in him. Maybe it was persistence he was teaching them. Maybe it was the fellowship that Jesus was enjoying with him. Let's just explore this. I don't know if it's contextually accurate here, but Jesus had to spend more time with him than the average person that got healed. Sometimes in my life and in your life, I have found that in the areas where I'm still developing my sight, I'm still growing in my strength, that those are the areas where the Lord actually fellowships with me the most in my weakness. When I find myself dealing with an issue once again, Lord, I, I, I see wrongly. Lord, I've done wrongly. Lord's like, I know, here we are again, having fellowship over brokenness. Wouldn't it be rad, Luke, if we get a fellowship over wholeness? We're getting there. But sometimes it's in your brokenness and sometimes it's in my lack of sight that the Lord has the sweetest times with us. Let me just propose it this way. Let's say you are 100% well. You saw well, you did well, you knew well, everything. There's a chance in your humanity and your selfishness, you wouldn't check in with the Lord anymore. There's a chance you wouldn't need the Lord anymore. 
You're just gonna go about your merry way doing your merry things. And maybe the Lord in his sovereignty said, hey, I'm gonna give you a few chinks in your armor. The way he said with Paul, he said, I'm gonna give you a thorn in the flesh. Paul prayed three times, Lord, can we get rid of this thing? And the Lord said, stop praying for that. It ain't going away. My grace is sufficient for you. My riches at my expense. I'll be with you, Paul. I'll sustain you. Remember Jacob when he got his hip put out of place? Okay, now he had like a gangster swagger. He's kind of walking in, you know. He wasn't a lady, he was a different guy. And God gave that to him. I'm, re- I'm like, I'm wrestling with the Lord. So was Jacob. I wrestle with that. Lord, why are you gonna make me walk differently and have these things? He said, well, that's where our fellowship becomes deeper. Especially in this broken world. You guys know it's a broken world, right? This world is fading away. The philosophies of mankind are prevailing. The antichrist spirit is already here. Read first, second, and third John. This world's messed up. And so when we find ourselves dealing with life and going through situations, the Lord's right there saying, I can actually have sweeter fellowship with you in this context, believe it or not. Well, Jesus here lays hands on this guy, spits on him, leads him out of town, says, what do you see? He says, I see men walking. Verse 25, he says, then he put his hands on him again, made him look up. And when he was restored and he saw everyone clearly, we can guess by the language here that this man had seen before. He wasn't born blind. Something had gone wrong. He's now restored to where he was. When? When he looked up. (laughs) One of my favorite stories in all the Bible, Jesus tells of the prodigal son who went hog wild. He went crazy. And then one day he's like, what am I? And he looks up. And the Bible says he's restored. He looks up and he's convicted. Same with Nebuchadnezzar, who had seven years on the backside of the desert. And finally he looks up. Man, there's no better thing to do in your blindness and your smallness and your sadness, your silliness. Just look up. Look up to the Lord. And immediately this guy was made whole. Notice the instructions given to him, though, in verse 30, or 26. It says, then he sent him away to his house, saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Stop right there, eyes up here. We know Jesus was trying to keep a wraps on some of these miracles that were happening because he didn't want his fame to explode in these regions and him to get in trouble and his disciples to get arrested yet. We know it was kind of damage control and crowd control. It's interesting, though, he says, don't go back into this town. Don't even tell anybody in this town. You go home. I don't know where this guy's from, but he's not from Bethsaida. Jesus had a little bone to pick with the people of Bethsaida. They didn't want anything to do with him. And Jesus says, don't even tell anybody there in the town, but you go home and you testify what I've done for you and how important and how imperative it is that our lives are used as a witness in our hometowns where God has put us. Last night I was making some of these videos and I got another video I'm gonna share in just a few minutes. I was going through pictures and I saw some of you guys in my photo album. It's like, man, I just love how you guys are growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. In, in this, what I consider our hometown. This is our area. This is our community. And God has our lights shining right now. How important it is that we go where God asks us to go. Guys, let's see what happens next. I want you to get this one more story before we run out of time today. Look at verse 27. It says, now Jesus and his disciples went out, of the ta- went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, who do men say that I am? Well, so they answered, John the Baptist, some say. And some say Elijah, but others say one of the prophets. In Matthew 16, they add one of the pro- uh, Jeremiah's, who some people think you are. Verse 29, and he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, you're the Christ. And then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. Stop right there, eyes up here. This story is now repeated in Mark's gospel, chapter eight right here. We've already studied it. If you've been through the gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, this is like the reader's digest kind of cliff notes version that Mark gives us. Matthew goes into greater detail and greater context and greater depth. And so we're gonna be drawing from Matthew's story as well as we know what happened there in Caesarea Philippi. And this is a big deal. This is about three quarters of the way into Jesus's ministry. And he now takes his boys furthest north he would ever go to Caesarea Philippi, to Gentile country. This would have been the most pagan of pagan areas in their realm ever. And Jesus says, let's go up there. The boys at this point would have said, I don't think that's a good idea. Maybe we go back to Galilee, you know, where we're from. And Jesus is teaching them in the midst of their obstinance, in the midst of their blindness, 
And he takes him to this backdrop of paganness and worldliness and confusion and chaos. This would be where Rome had established themselves and Caesar Augustus had a temple built there for himself. This is where the worship of Pan was happening and all kinds of chaotic things and paganism and worldliness and tattoo artists. And it's just like downtown Portland. It's just right there, man. They would have had it all there. As a matter of fact, we were there last March, not this March, but the March previously. Go ahead and play these videos while I'm talking about this area. Uh, There's no sound on these videos but this is the area where Jesus would have taken them. Right there on the bottom was the original Starbucks right there where they had that. And uh, right there they would have had all kinds of uh, pagan idols there and there would have been prostitutes and stuff going on, weird things. These are the headwaters uh, uh, near the Tel Dan area, northern Israel. You'll see the water in just a minute. Uh, They say it's upwards of 700 million gallons of water per hour. I'm not quite sure if that's, that's accurate, but it's pretty close to that, maybe 7 million gallons of water per hour. Uh, My son Noah will be seen in the next video. There's the water right there. This would be where they would go outside of their comfort zone, outside of the realm of normal Jewish practices. This would be like the most confusing area, as I mentioned, where all kinds of worldly ways and worldly philosophies were introduced. And Jesus on the way there says, hey, what do men say of me? Now, this is kind of an interesting question. If I were to ask that question, hey, what, what, what's, what do people think of Luke Rochette? A, that's a bad thing to ask. <laughs> I, don't need to, I don't need to know. But then you'd have to ask my heart, what do you want to know for? Well, I'm just curious what people think about me. And it'd be a weird question for you or me to ask what the rest of the world thinks about us. But Jesus here knows this is the most important question anybody will ever ask about him. It actually doesn't matter what you think about me. It doesn't matter what I think about you. That doesn't matter at all. The most important question you'll ever answer ever is the question that Jesus asked here. What do men say about me? Because this answer to this question will lead into the answer to every question you're ever asked from here on out. Who is Jesus Christ? Now, Jesus Christ, just so you guys know, is the most famous person in the world today. Do you guys know that? For the nine billion people or whatever it is that exist right now, he's the most famous of anybody, Jesus Christ. Everybody, everybody, if not everybody, maybe there's a few, but if not everybody has some concept of who Jesus Christ is, they've heard his name. They've heard his story, little bits and pieces. And yet Jesus here, the most famous person in our day, asks in that day, what do men say of me? And their answer was threefold. Some think you're Elijah, some think you're John the Baptist, and some think you're one of the prophets. And Jesus said, okay. All those are, by the way, high compliments, right? Right? Wouldn't you be honored to be confused with Elijah? You're like, really? The Old Testament prophet? Man, that guy was hardcore. Like, thanks for noticing. Good job, you know. Elijah prayed fire down. He killed bad guys. He did miracles. And maybe there's a little confusion. You're like, Jesus, Jesus, like, really? They think I'm that guy? Like, that's kind of cool. Well, some think you're John the Baptist. That was his older cousin that had just recently been beheaded. Like, talk about confusing. Like, what? He's just, they saw us together. These guys are all messed up on their ideas. And we can get messed up, can't we? We can get pretty confused in our philosophies and our religions. People can twist us really easily and take us down a road that's incongruent with Scripture. It takes the whole Bible to make a whole Christian. Don't be taking little pieces out of context, okay? And watch out for getting out of the context of the Scriptures. And there's deception upon deception upon deception upon deception, If you don't think you're deceived, you might be deceived. Lord, just search my heart. In that day, Jesus on the scene, it couldn't be more clear. I think it's Elijah. Eh, wrong. He's probably John the Baptist. Eh, wrong. And then some people who are a little less confident, he's probably one of the prophets. (laughs) Let's go with that. It's a pretty safe bet. By the way, Moses had prophesied in Deuteronomy 18, said there will be a prophet coming after me like me. This is the one to look for. And the person that doesn't worship him will be destroyed. And like, maybe it's him, maybe it's that prophet. And this is the word on the street. Who is Jesus? And all these people have a philosophy. It's crazy. You could ask anybody on the street, who's Jesus? And most people, unless they're weird, atheist, satanic, rebel rousers, most people, even agnostic atheists will say, oh yeah, Jesus, he's, he's a great guy, yeah. Didn't he say something like turn the other cheek and, and love the poor? Pfft, love that stuff, love that stuff. Oprah, there's interviews with Oprah who says of herself that she is indeed a Christian. She goes on to say that she believes in the teachings of Jesus, but then she calls herself an open Christian, okay? An open Christian meaning that there's other ways to believe and other ways to God and other ways to live your life, which by the way, an open Christian is also a non-Christian, just so you guys know. Eh, eh, it doesn't count, Oprah. You can pray for Oprah. 
Bono, the lead singer of U2, when he was interviewed, asked what he believed about Jesus, and he had a great summer. He said, well, if a man lived 2,000 years ago, and if he died and was buried and rose again, which I believe he did, and if that man then changed billions of people's lives since then, there's only one conclusion. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And so U2, uh, lead singer Bono, believes that Jesus is the Messiah. What do you believe about Jesus? Now, again, you're the 8 a.m. crowd. So chances are you didn't come here thinking it was a garage sale on accident. <laughs> you guys are probably, you're like, what the heck is this? You know, all these, it's a new garage sale. No, it's not a garage sale. Those hoodies are 10 bucks. Don't take those, you know? <laughs> <laughs> when Jesus asked this to the disciples, he looked at them and said, what do you say? And Peter pipes up. So grateful for Peter. Peter pipes up. In Matthew 16, you guys can read it later. Matthew 16, the very last section before the chapter ends. Peter pipes up and said, you're the Christ. Now, some of you guys think that Jesus' last name was Christ. Jesus Christ, and you know, his mom was Mary Christ. And Christ was not his last name. Jesus Christ. Jesus was his first name. It was very common, Joshua, Yeshua. Christ was a title reserved for one person only, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Peter's answer here is so profound Jesus looks at his friends and says, but what do you say? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. Now, this is an abbreviated version. Peter didn't stop there. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus looked at him and said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And on this rock, on this foundation, on this confession, I'm gonna build my church. Jesus was excited about this clarity and this answer. And he gave all credit to his father. He said, the only reason you know this is because my dad showed you. My father in heaven opened up your heart to see that Jesus Christ is Lord. That it's not an open religion. It's closed. It is Christianity, Jesus Christ, Jesus first, Jesus, 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 all Jesus, only Jesus, ever been Jesus. And when you know that, man, it's because the Lord's opened up your heart to see that. And where did Jesus ask this question? In the most dark, in that time, the most pagan, the most idolatrous, the most confused place ever. And I believe Jesus brought them there to show them that the light shines in the darkness. That Jesus would ask you, would ask me, would ask our sons and daughters and the people around us, hey, who's Jesus to you? I love how Jesus addressed Peter. We don't have it here, it's in Matthew. Simon Bar-Jonah. That was his, Bar-Jonah means Simon, son of Jonah. Simon was his birth name, his surname. Jesus had changed it to Peter right in this moment. And he said, Simon Barjona, I'm gonna change your name from Simon, which means shifting sand, to Peter, which means rock. And it was right there at the sheer faces of that rock that I showed you in the video. Jesus said, I'm gonna build my church upon this simple confession, this simple foundation of faith that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And this question is the question that will help you to answer every other question throughout your entire life. Who is Jesus Christ to you? He's the son of God. He's my savior. The Bible tells us in the New Testament that you can't confess Jesus Christ as Lord apart from the help of the Holy Spirit. You just can't do it. And again, I believe you've all done this. Maybe, maybe there's somebody here this morning, though, that hasn't done that. You're not firm in your faith like Jesus would look to you and say, hey, who am I to you? And when you say Jesus is Lord, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter nine and 10 that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, we are saved. Through the confession of the mouth and the believing of the heart, we're brought to salvation in Jesus' name. And I believe the Lord was, here's the deal though. We don't have time to get into the next portion. But Jesus then began to look at his disciples and maybe the eagerness in their eyes the desire to then go to the next levels of understanding and kingdom building. And Jesus told them immediately, as a matter of fact, just for context, let's read this next portion, and then we're gonna have the worship team come up. He says in verse 31, and he began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed after three days and then rise again. And he spoke this word openly, 
And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had depart, turned around and looked at Peter, saying to the disciples, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of man. Last closing thoughts, and I want you to wrestle with this all day, all week, all month, and all year. You guys are believers in Jesus Christ. I am too. He's my savior. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And even as the worship team comes up and reminds us to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, Jesus immediately on the heels of this confection, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, got their attention and said, here's what's gonna happen next, boys. I'm gonna be betrayed. The scribes, the Pharisees, the ruling leaders, they're gonna kill me. And on the third day, I'm gonna rise from the dead. They didn't hear that part, by the way, right over their head. And Peter began to argue with Jesus. No, 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 that's not a good idea. We'll study this out next week. Peter grabbed Jesus and led him away from the crowd. He's like, hey, you're starting to freak people out, man. You gotta stop talking like that. And he insisted to Jesus, you got it all messed up. That can't be with the Messiah. We just identified you're the Messiah. You're here now. You're gonna restore Israel to its glory. You're gonna give us political sureness and victory. And Jesus says, no, no, no. The way to the crown is through a life of suffering. The way to victory in this life is to not hold on to this life. Jesus will continue on in this passage to say, if you hold on to your life, if you try and get it all here, you're gonna lose everything. But if you lose your life here, you're going to gain everything. Where did he do this? Where did he say this? In this world that had everything offered to them, worldliness and power and pleasure, all these things were being given to him. And they just, oh, it's, it's all about you, Jesus. said, it is. We gotta live a vertical life. This world will take you for a ride. It'll take you hostage. It'll take you further than you wanna go. It'll keep you longer than you wanna stay. It'll rip you off. And if you let go of your life, and if you live it for my glory and for others' good, you'll find your life. Jesus here going so deep with his boys. They're worried about the bread that they forgot to pack. What are we gonna do? He says, why is your heart so hard? Have you forgotten everything? And you might as well just nod and say, yeah, I forgot everything. Lord, would you forgive me of my sins? As a matter of fact, let's just bow our heads and pray as we go into a song right now. Jesus, we ask God that you would do just that. Lord, we see in this stories your persistence, Lord, your desire to heal this blind man and to deliver him from this town of Bethsaida. Don't go back in there. Be different. And then Jesus, you led your boys to Caesarea Philippi and said, what do you say? And on that confession, lives were changed. And Jesus, I pray right now that our lives would change. And I'm just gonna give a simple opportunity for you to respond. If there's areas in your life right now where you're holding on to, you just, man, I just, I gotta get that promotion. I, I gotta get that, that, that thing, that pleasure I'm just seeking after, that one thing in this world. I just see it, I sense it. If I can just get that one thing, I know I'll be happy. And the Lord would say to you, let go of that. Don't be taken stray by that. Put your eyes on me. Jesus, when he was forecasting his death, these disciples, these followers, they knew that that was also forecasting their death. If he's gonna die, they're gonna die. That was bad news for them in that point. They didn't understand to not be worldly minded in this way. And I'm gonna make it so simple. If, you just would, if you're struggling with worldly mindedness, and you just fill it in, and you wanna be more heavenly minded, and you need the Lord's supernatural help, would you just raise up your hand right now? Lord, I wanna be more spiritually minded. Lord, I wanna be more heavenly minded. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Lord, wash me and cleanse me. Lord, we might have a high view of you, Lord, but we wanna have the view that you are the savior of the world and the king of my, whole, my heart. And we want you to take, Lord, anything and everything and lead us where you want us. You can put your hands down. Would you guys all stand with me? We're gonna sing a song right now. This is an opportunity for you to respond to the Lord. If you need to come to the altar and kneel, or if you need prayer, there'll be some prayer people on my right, on my left, John and Lucy, and I'll be over here. If you need prayer, come get prayer. Let's worship the Lord right now and respond and say, Lord Jesus, make us more heavenly-minded than we are earthly-minded. Let's worship together.